Welcome test dummies to the Cardboard Crash Course. I'm your safety instructor Ethan, and today we're going to be taking a test drive through the Necrovirus, a faction present in the Twilight Imperium 4th edition base game and upgraded with the components in the Prophecy of Kings expansion. This will be both a component overview as well as a more in-depth guide later in the video, so go ahead and skip there if you're interested. And if you like this video, go ahead and like and subscribe, as well as share it with others as it does help out the channel. And if you're interested, turn on notifications to see all the ones in the future. So without further ado, let's go ahead and head on out and check these guys out. Here we have the Necros faction sheet. After the fall of the Lazax Empire, the magnificent mind of the scientist Mordai I broke off from the growing L1Z1X mind net and instead of simply relying on technology, changed himself and those he loved into the technology, merging their minds with those of computer programs. In the process of doing so, they lost what little compassion they had left, and became malicious machines, capable of horrifying reproduction and assimilation, planning to take over the minds and bodies of all those who stand with or against them. So these horrible, monstrous creations start on the planet of Mordai II, this is a four resource and zero influence planet home system that really shows what the Necro are all about. The resource value is pretty nice and allows them for a interesting and flexible start, allowing you to get maybe a extra carrier and some infantry off of it or whatever else you need. But the influence is really not that big of a hindrance to them as we'll see in a little bit. They can get command counters off a lot of ways that isn't influence, and it really doesn't matter for the voting phase for them. Now they also of course have their starting fleet. This consists of one dreadnought, one carrier, one cruiser, two fighters, two infantry, and a space dock. Now they notably don't have any PDS, so no big defensive units and only one carrier, but like I said, that four resources should take care of that. But they do, however, have two infantry, which are very important to them, especially when we can get some of their later units out. Not a bad start, and these guys in particular really don't need that big of a start because they'll get ahead of people very quickly here. Now, they do also start with a single normal technology. This is Daxiv Animators, a green technology with one prerequisite that says, After you win a ground combat, you may place one infantry from your reinforcements on that planet. So like I said, their infantry are important to them, and this really lets them do their aggressive playstyle in a more efficient way, and lets you get infantry back from what you've lost in ground combat. I like this a lot, and it works perfectly with them. I'll hold off for a second on talking about their other two starting technology, and we'll take a look at their faction abilities first. This is Galactic Threat, Technological Singularity, and Propagation. Starting off with Galactic Threat, this says, You cannot vote on agendas. Once per agenda phase, after an agenda is revealed, you may predict aloud the outcome of that agenda. If your prediction is correct, gain one technology that is owned by a player who voted how you predicted. So one thing to note about this is that gaining that technology does not actually allow you to research this. So research triggers don't go off, but you don't have to follow the prerequisites that you normally would do when you're researching a tech. This allows you to get any technology that that person has, whether it be a normal or a unit upgrade. Now they also have technological singularity, which is a different way of getting them. This says, once per combat, after one of your opponent's units is destroyed, you may gain one technology that is owned by that player. So this doesn't actually have to win the combat, and you don't even have to go up against that big of a fleet for this to happen. This also can trigger on both a space and a ground combat, as they are two separate instances. Now I think this is a good time to check out their faction-specific technologies that they start with. This is the Valifar Assimilator X and Valifar Assimilator Y technologies. They say, when you would gain another player's technology using one of your faction abilities, you may place the X or Y Assimilator token respectively on a faction technology owned by that player instead. While that token is on a technology, this card gains that technology's text. You cannot place an Assimilator token on technology that already has an Assimilator token. 
So this allows you to take any faction-specific technology, which every faction starts with two of, and take that for yourself. This sparks a lot of crazy combos, and you'll really have to be looking at who everybody is around the table from the very start of the game to use these with. They do not essentially do anything on their own, but they get those tokens on them and really start popping off. Their final faction ability is Propagation. This says you cannot research technology. When you would research a technology, gain three command tokens instead. This is why their influence doesn't really matter to them. This allows them to not only get command tokens when the status phase occurs, but also anytime you would pop the primary or secondary of the technology card, and any time that an action card would tell you to research something. I like this a lot and really puts them ahead of the game with command tokens. Now they do of course also have a couple of faction specific units, the flagship and the mech. Starting with the flagship, the Alistair. This says, at the start of the space combat, choose any number of ground forces in the system to participate in that combat as if they were ships. This also has the sustained damage ability, costs 8, has a 9 times 2 combat value, a movement of 1, and a capacity of 3. This is a really interesting flagship because it's not amazing on its own, but the 3 capacity, it really lets you bring around a bigger defense than most people can. Every single infantry or mech now will be fighting with you on the air as well as on the ground, and you don't even have to choose all of them if you want to make sure that you keep enough to hit the ground when you need to. I like it a lot and really allows them to have a swarm playstyle. Now moving on to their mech, the Mordred. This of course has the cost of 2, combat value of 6, and sustained damage abilities of all other mechs, but also have during combat against an opponent who has an X or Y token on one of more of their techs, apply plus two to the result of each of those units' combat rolls. This allows you to not only take that person's technology, but also continue to attack them and get bonuses after doing so. This lets you really hammer down on one of your opponents and slowly take them out of the game if you can swarm up with these guys. Now they also, of course, have their three leaders. These are very important to use on yourself, as we'll take a look at in just a second. Starting with the Agent. This is Necromalian. It says, during the action phase, you may exhaust this card to choose a player. That player may discard one action card or spend one command token from their command sheet to gain two trade goods. Now we haven't yet, while we're looking at this, seen an ability that lets them draw action cards, but we do have an abundance of command tokens from the propagation. This, of course, starts the game face up and allows you to exhaust immediately. This really puts you ahead on not only command tokens, but also on resources to build up your fleets. Moving on to the commander, we have Necro Akados. This is an unlockable ability that unlocks when you own three different techs. The Valifar Assimilator technologies count only if their X or Y token is on a technology. So you don't actually have this unlocked from the start of the game, but it shouldn't be too difficult to grab. And once you do, you get the passive ability. After you gain a technology, you may draw one action card. So, like I said before, they didn't really have any ways of getting action cards ahead of everybody else, but now they do. You can gain multiple technologies in a single combat, and even more in the agenda phase, and this will allow you to get a ton of action cards that you can use both in combat and to continue your buildup of all the resources. Just as a really simple way of putting them ahead. Finally, for their leaders, we'll move on to the hero. This is Unit Design Flayish. It's unlocked by having three scored objectives, just like all other heroes, and when you unlock it, it gives you Polymorphic Algorithm Devour World. It's an action that says, choose a planet that has a technology specialty in a system that contains your units. Destroy any other player's units on that planet. Gain trade goods equal to the planet's combined resource and influence values, and gain one technology that matches the specialty of that planet. Then purge this card. So this is a once per game ability, and really is a flashy one that you really need to use at a perfect time to be useful 
But even if you just willy-nilly use it, they're already very far ahead of everybody. And any amount of getting technologies or destroying people's units out of turn is really powerful for them. Even though it's a once per game, this is a powerful ability that's fun to see at the table. Now finally on their faction specific cards, we of course have the promissory note. This is called antivirus. You give this out to another player and they gain the ability, at the start of a combat, place this card face up in your play area. While this card is in your play area, the necro player cannot use his technological singularity faction ability against you. If you activate a system that contains one or more of the necro player's units, return this card to the necro player. So this is a really interesting one because if you start trading it off, it of course can be traded around and you don't know who's going to use it against you, but it's really not that bad as getting one time not being able to use it won't put them too far back, but you are going to be wanting to be careful if you're planning something and maybe never give this out in the first place. You don't really have to as the Necrovirus. So there we have it. As you can see, they're a very strange faction and are hard to get the right feel for right off the bat. I wouldn't normally suggest this to new players, but it is a lot of fun to do. And this whole not being able to vote and not researching technology is completely out of the ordinary for this game. Now we'll go ahead and take a look at some ways of playing this faction, as well as some other cards and strategies that these guys like in order to play them effectively. Man, do I love the Necrovirus. These guys are so conniving and evil at the table, but really in a more politically driven way and less in a, in a combat focused malicious way than you'd think when you first look at their faction sheet. These guys were introduced as one of the very last races along with the Arborek in Twilight Imperium 3rd edition. And when you look at their faction sheet, it hasn't changed very much. And they're super interesting. If I told you that they do what you need to do in this game really, really well, you probably wouldn't believe me at first. Not being able to research tech and not being able to vote on agendas seems like a huge deal, but really isn't that crazy as you'd think at first. Before I get into that, I would like to say that the black pieces are perfect for them. It's really a dark evil color. And if you can't get your hands on it, then the red or orange works because of the similarities on their faction sheet there. I wish we had a silver or a gray color because of the mechanical nature of them, but you can't win them all. So starting off with the bread and butter here, we've got their faction abilities. The ability to not be able to vote on agendas and instead predicting sort of is a political ability in and of itself. Because at the start of the game, as soon as the agenda phase is going to be unlocked from getting Mechatol Rex, you're going to want to start voting on what is obvious, what people are definitely going to want to vote for. This is before you are the huge threat at the table, before you've gotten a million texts and are grabbing it from everybody, and are just gaining a couple here and there throughout the turn after everybody's already gotten theirs from the tech card. But later in the game, after you've started to become this big threat, after you've grabbed the head of the table and have gotten a ton of points where you can, you're actually going to want to think about using it against the rest of the playgroup. If predicting correctly would give you something that would either give you points or a huge advantage, like something like a war sun at the table, then you could start voting against what is predicted. This would give them a, a conundrum where either they vote against you, but for maybe a, an agenda that you would like, or with you and the agenda that they would like. So this sort of becomes a writer ability where you don't actually need to predict correctly. You just maybe need the threat of predicting correctly to get them away from what you need done. An important note about this ability is that it lets you not vote on agendas, but instead predict. It does not say anywhere that you can't use riders on this. So all of the action cards that you're going to be drawing throughout the game actually still can be used on agendas, even though you're not actually voting on them. You are part of the agenda phase, even if you aren't actively casting votes for them. 
The technological singularity, on the other hand, is also sort of strange compared to what you'd think of at first. They don't get huge benefits off of winning huge epic battles. Instead, they get the same exact benefits off of just destroying maybe one thing here, one thing there, coming in and nibbling off of everybody at the table for exactly what you need, instead of coming in and destroying everything at once. So keep in mind that both space combat and ground combat actually works with this. So if you come in and maybe take one carrier and then one infantry that somebody used to gain a planet, you're going to be getting two easy instances of technology right off the bat. So really the way that you're going to want to look at this is more of a opportunity to get tech and less of an opportunity to win a battle. Because whether or not you win, you get these abilities as long as something of theirs is destroyed. This brings us into the final ability that they have. You can't research tech. Instead, you get three command tokens when you would. This makes researching tech really interesting for them. I think that you're going to want to push towards every ability to research tech as possible. Three command tokens is huge. This is as much as soul with hypermetabolism would get at the end of each round. And you can actually get this multiple times per round along with the command tokens you get at the end. This puts you so far ahead of everybody else with command tokens that it's really going to cap you out as soon as just a few rounds in, which is really unheard of for anybody else. You wouldn't think right away that these guys are the command token faction even more than the soul is, but they really are and can get so many so quickly. Now, their start is interesting. Having that dreadnought and the carrier to bring out your infantry to start expanding is always nice. Um, but I think that you're going to want to use the four resources from your home planet for uh, a couple of mechs and start bringing them to where you think you're going to be putting down a space dock to build your flagship with later. The mechs are super important and let you get a four combat value for just two cost against somebody that you've already taken a faction ability from. This also, of course, has the sustained damage ability, making it so the mechs are really a better dreadnought in space combat as long as you have your flagship with it uh, in the same system. Noticeably, the flagship ability does not just say 3, which is the capacity value of the flagship. It says, rather, every single ground force, infantry, and mechs now in that system. So if you have a bunch of carriers in that system and your flagship, it makes it really an unstoppable fleet. And aside from maybe an agenda that could nuke you, I don't think that you're going to be slowed down with that sort of power. Coming back to their home system, that zero influence is no big deal at all for them. Forget about influence. Now, having a couple command tokens here and there with the influence at the beginning of the game might be nice if you need them uh, before you start being able to research technology. But I don't think you should worry about using leadership at all for that um, because of the crazy ability that you get with the propagation ability. Now, decks of animators, their starting technology, is really nice to confirm that you get at the beginning of the game because, like I said, you're going to want to bring in as little amount of resources as you can uh, for ground combat and space combat. So if you just bring in one or two infantry to take out a single infantry on a planet, you're going to want to get that infantry back to keep going. And you are going to have the command counters to do that, especially if you have the warfare card. Getting that infantry back after you've lost it is really nice to make sure you have. Now, what's interesting about these guys is I can't actually recommend a technology tree for them. Unlike most people, they don't have that. They don't have anything that's confirmed to them. And what makes it interesting is that the table can kind of decide amongst themselves what you're going to have access to. You can't get anything that other people don't already have. But what people are going to get most of the time and what your neighbors will probably have are things like Sarween tools, which lower the production value, Hypermetabolism, which gains you even more command tokens. Neural Motivator, which gets you action cards, which is important for that agent ability. 
And then fleet logistics, which is going to put you ahead when you need to be, allowing you to take multiple actions per turn. I think that Neural Motivator specifically is important here because not only are the action cards going to benefit you from riders on agendas as well as uh, combat tricks in combat and your agent ability, action cards really have everything that you need and you're going to want to grab as many as you can. Hypermetabolism is less of a issue here because you're going to have so many command counters you don't know what to do with. Getting an extra at the end of every phase is not actually that big of a deal for them. That sounds funny that I'm telling you not to get as many command counters as possible, but they have so many already. I, I don't know if you're even going to find needs for them. A few other interesting ones that aren't immediately apparent are light wave deflector. If you have asteroid belts near your home system, getting to where you need to go is always very important. Duranium armor, because of that mech ability to sustain damage, repairing those units between rounds of space combat is really nice with your flagship. And then bio stems. With the Valifar Simulator, you're going to be grabbing a couple of faction technologies throughout the game. And if you get ones that have action abilities, then you're going to want bio stims to be able to do that multiple times in a turn. Now, of course, you can grab things like the War Sun technology, which might be a little overkill, especially when you need to spend 12 for it. Instead, I think that early on, you're going to want to look for people who have the Destroyer 2 technology. This is because the Anti-Fighter Barrage step is actually in space combat, unlike something like Bombardment, which is out of combat entirely. Being able to go in, use your Anti-Fighter Barrage, and especially an upgraded version of it, because skimming off a couple of fighters off the top and then retreating out is going to trigger the technological singularity even though you've retreated because something was destroyed. I think that any easy way to get things taken out in combat and still be able to escape with your life is very important to them. So the anti-fighter barrage is something to keep in mind. So I won't be able to go through all of them here or we'd be here for a very long time. But what are some interesting faction technologies to look out for in the game? Now I'll give you a few here because not every faction is going to definitely be in your game, but a good majority of these might be on people's minds to pick as they're all very interesting factions. First off, the Mahakt with the genetic recombination ability. This makes it so people have to vote the way that you want them to, or at least one person has to. Uh, it allows you to really part be part of the political nature of the voting phase, even though you don't actually vote yourself. Uh, Mentax, mirror computing, is very powerful for them and really would be powerful for anybody. This lets you use trade goods uh, and double their value every time you would spend them. So being able to grab things like the War Sun tech right away or just be able to produce as many mechs as possible or your flagship right away is great for them. And really, I couldn't say that it would be bad in any situation. Saving resources is always a good thing. Next up, we have things like the Barony Letnev's non-Euclidean non non shielding, the Sardak Nor's Valkyrie particle weave, the Cabal's Vortex and Dimensional Tears, and then the Nazarkaz Supercharge, as well as the Federation of Souls Spec Ops 2. This is a kind of exhaustive list of all of the best combat things that I could think of. This allows you to really get ahead in combat, make sure that you're grabbing at least one thing off of every time you go in, and give yourself the best odds of winning, because you're not going to want to lose anything to the combat, even though you have that Dax of Animators. Their biggest weakness is really spreading out. Even though you have your command tokens and resources, the biggest problem for their necrovirus is time. So in any possible way that you can shape it, you're going to want to put yourself in a situation where you don't lose the things that you've already spread out and gotten to. We also have uh, SARS chaos mapping. 
This lets you pretty much become the SAR player if there's an asteroid belt near your home system, but you still have to keep control of your home system for it, which shouldn't be a problem. Um, and then we have Isaril's Magion implants, as well as the Nomad's Temporal Command Suite. A couple of interesting ones, the Magion implants lets you take action cards from people. This allows you two things in one. One is, your, of course, your agent ability, and the other is taking people's abilities to take you over away from them. And then in Nomad's Temporal Command Suite, allows you to unexhaust any person on the uh, table's agent. This is very important for yourself, getting you more trade goods off of those action cards, as well as giving you political power over the table that you might not immediately have being seen as a more manipulative faction, but somebody would really love getting their agent unexhausted. And you can, of course, make them pay for it or make them get off of a system you may need to get to. Definitely keep in mind and maybe keep a list with you of all the faction techs of all of the other factions in the game because picking out the perfect ones is very important. However, you are allowed to switch them out because you don't actually have to keep one the entire game. You can take the uh, token off of one and swap it out when you gain a different person's technology. Finally, with their components, the leaders and the promissory note. The leaders are very good used on themselves. Their agent and their commander work perfectly together. Getting a technology lets you get an action card, and then you can, of course, discard an action card or a uh, command token from your command sheet to get two trade goods. This really has no detriment to it, and you're almost never going to want to sell it because getting the two trade goods is the pretty much defined price of it, and if you're not getting more than that for some reason or another, uh, maybe an in installments, then... I would say always use it on yourself. Um, something to keep in mind is that Alliance promissory note. I would almost never give it to somebody like the Jolnar, although that seems like a definite use for them. It's really bad because these guys are so good that something like the Jolnar is really their biggest threat in the game because of the Jolnar's consistency and power. So you don't actually want to give the Jolnar more power than they actually have already. Somebody that I may give it to, maybe the Sardak Nor or the Nomad or somebody like that, which definitely want specific technologies and want to research as much as possible, but aren't like crazy out of the gate powerful and are more of a political ally in this than somebody like the Jolnar who would be immediate enemies. Finally, for their leaders, the polymorphic algorithm, that hero, uh, like I said, is really more flashy than anything. Destroying all of that person's ships and units is really nice if you need to clear somebody off, especially if you're going for Mechatol Rex, which they can hold pretty well. But it doesn't trigger your tech singularity ability, so keep that in mind. However, you do get a technology off of this card depending on that technology specialty. But like I said, if you're going for Rex, unfortunately, you don't actually get a tech off of this because Rex does not have any specialties to it. But it would get you a lot of trade goods because um, Rex does have that really high seven combined uh, value. So you're going to get a whole bunch of off this hero. What I really suggest using this for is the most amount of trade goods possible. If you're going to be getting points or taking over somebody's home system because of this hero, then definitely wait for that. But if you can't find an immediate use for it, I say just get as many trade goods as possible with it. Lastly, moving on to that promissory note, the antivirus, I would say almost never give this out because it'll probably be traded to somebody and then if they are playing correctly, then they'll trade it to somebody else who'll need it more without you knowing about it. And then they'll use it on it when and then they'll use it on you when you least expect it. It isn't really that big of a deal to have it used once against you, but I wouldn't even suggest getting it out there in the first place, because it is unfortunately one of those promissory notes that 
don't have a benefit to that person, instead just hurt you. So it, not only will it be difficult to sell, but also pretty bad for you to sell. Finally, I want to take a look at the uh, strategy cards real quick and see how they feel about all of them. First is, of course, leadership. Getting extra command tokens from this and spending influence for it is not good at the beginning of the game for them. Instead, you're probably going to want to research as much te technology as possible. Uh, their ability, which triggers multiple times, is already a leadership ability. And especially at the beginning of the game, you're not actually going to be able to expand as much as you think you might be able to. So getting so many command counters that you don't know what to do with is really not useful unless you need to make a huge fleet in one system or need to do a ton of secondaries. But I would stay away from this until you definitely need it late game and maybe not at all. Diplomacy is sort of neutral for them. Because once you hit a system, you actually kind of want people to come into you if you have it completely locked down. Being able to have them come in, destroy a couple things, and then you retreat out is something that you should be thinking about and considering. So diplomacy, being able to lock down a system, is only really good when you need that for points. And otherwise, you should probably think about whether or not you actually maybe want them to attack you. So politics is three great things in one for them. Getting the speaker token or giving it to somebody who is near you is great, getting exactly what you need. The two action cards is also great, also exactly what you need. Uh, getting, being able to use that leader, combat tricks, like I said, everything action cards give you. And then looking at the top two cards of the agenda deck and scrying them is great because although you don't actually participate in that, like I said, you can manipulate it and have it go the way you want. So doing politics is really put you, putting you at an advantage for that phase. Construction is really important for them because they don't have any other way of dropping down a space dock. You're going to want to put that in a uh, opportune spot in order to pop up that flagship or any other unit as soon as you need them. Now trade is very good for them. Getting those resources is pretty much the only thing that they're lacking here. They have the ability to get a lot of them late game and they have the ability to get a lot of command counters all the time but in the early games you're going to want to spread out a lot and getting those trade goods are exactly what you need to do that. You can't use them on agendas, but not that big of a deal. Now, I'd go as far to say that Warfare may be the best, if not tied for the best strategy card for them. Their biggest issue, like I said, is time. And Warfare can kind of accelerate that time. Pushing into another system when you have all those extra command counters is exactly what you need to do. And it's spreading out and getting to more places more opportune moments to grab things that people leave behind or people will purposely negotiate to let you take in order to pop that technological singularity ability is super important to them. And then also producing more in your home system with that high for uh, value on more data second is super powerful. Next up, technology. Now, when I said that warfare was tied, it was definitely with this. Researching one technology and then spending six resources to research another technology essentially means spend six resources to get six command counters. And that sounds like a great deal to me. I mean, leadership is completely left in the dust from this. Even the secondary ability, spending one token and four resources to get three tokens is two resources per token and is still better than leadership. So in a weird way, this is kind of their leadership and is almost double the value, if not triple the value, of everybody else doing it. Finally is Imperial. Now these guys don't exactly scream Mechatel Rex, but they're not bad at taking it. Dropping all those ground forces on there and then being able to use them for space combat when they need, especially with those new mechs, is a really great way to hunker down and not let anybody take Mechatol Rex at all. 
if you have the speaker token from politics, like I said, it was important earlier, then you're almost definitely going to be getting this. And then just getting points and spending your time sitting there is not a bad idea for them at all. And you're going to be super hard to take off. So there's the necrovirus. They're sort of hard to talk about because they just have so much going on for them. It's kind of hard to play them wrong, but at the same time, they're kind of the opposite of what you'd think they were from the beginning. They're very politically charged, manipulative, and really need their turns planned out far in advance to be able to go and grab at those opportune moments exactly the tiny bits that you need to really build up your army and get the points throughout the game. Don't think of yourself like you're the Cabal. Think of yourself like you're more like the Empyrean or the Hakan, where your abilities are kind of a threat to everybody, and you need to explain to people why they should help you, because otherwise you're going to steamroll them. Helping the Necrovirus is actually not that bad of an idea, because I guarantee that that person will leave you alone if you just drop off maybe one or two things for them. And then on the Necroviruses side, this also is very useful because you're not losing huge fleets. You only have to grab one or two things. This really is a backwards way of thinking for everybody at the table, but it benefits you so much. And then having all of those command counters extra, being able to grab multiple systems worth of stuff at the edge of each person's pie slice is just going to put you farther and farther ahead it's just a couple of turns into the game. I hope you guys have a ton of fun playing the Necrovirus, especially with these new Prophecy of Kings expansion uh, components and upgrades for them. And I really hope that you had fun here today and learned something new. Maybe just got yourself in the mindset for your upcoming game. If you did enjoy yourself, please like and subscribe, comment, ring that bell for more videos like this, more card game, board game content in the future from the channel. I love talking to you guys in the comments, so keep those coming. All the positive feedback has been great, and I really appreciate it. If you have any criticism, I'd love to hear it as well, as I'm always trying to improve. Have a great rest of your day, you all, and bye-bye.